My name is Liz Brownlee. Um, I'm going to be looking at my notes a little bit because I'm brand new to this job. Um, this is my first ever youth educator grant webinar, but I'm not new to your world of um, on-farm education and, and ag education. I've been a youth educator in the past and, and I'm a farmer now. We raise livestock on my farm here in Indiana. Um, and I'm really glad to be part of the SARE team um, as of this year. So uh, our webinar today is about the Youth Educator Grant, um, and just to make sure you're in the right place, a uh, quick affinity check, this grant is all about helping educators implement new or innovative sustainable ag efforts or expand existing efforts, and sharing with other educators is a critical piece of how the grant works. Um, the funding is uh, up to $6,000. The deadline is in November, November 7, at 4 p.m. Central. And who's eligible? That's youth educators in our 12 states of the North Central region. We'll show a map in a little bit. Um, and we take a really broad definition of who counts as a youth educator. So assuming all that still sounds interesting and good to you, um, stick around because we're gonna, um, we're gonna have a good session today. Um, we're gonna go over quickly what is SARE. Um, if you don't know us, I hope um, you'll get to know us a little bit. And then mostly we're gonna focus on the basics of how this grant works. Um, what you need to include in your proposal, where to find help as you put together your proposal, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. So you can at any time put questions in the chat or just jot them down. We'll do questions uh, about halfway through. And then if anybody uh, wants to stay, we're going to do a little bonus uh, in the second chunk of time um, in our hour here today to do step-by-step -step instructions so you can see how to use the SARE online grant system, um, what it looks like when you're putting together your proposal. All right, so first, what is SARE? Um, we are the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Group. You can see the four regions um, there on the map. And so we cover, I think of it as the Midwest and the Plains. Um, and we're part of a national organization under the umbrella of the USDA, US Department of Agriculture. Um, and what is our mission? We're here to advance sustainable innovations to the whole of American agriculture whether it's um, urban ag or large scale row crop farming, whether it's you know wineries or livestock production, anywhere in between and far beyond, um, we're, we're in it. And so we see educators applying to teach all sorts of aspects of sustainable ag. Um, but before I get ahead of myself, I'll just point out that basically we have two real arms. Um, one of those is outreach materials. So that's the books and bulletins you see on the left there. And, just to say that if you need some teaching tools, especially if you're working with older students, some of these books and bulletins um, can be really helpful tools and they're available free uh, on our website for as digital copies. Um, and if you work with a nonprofit or school, you might be able to request a packet of, of free books, hard copies as well, or bulletins. Um, Marie is our communications person um, and she can tell you all about it. The other thing we do, so we do the outreach, and all those outreach materials are based on what farmers and ranchers have learned over the last 30 some odd years of SARE. Um, so it's very much applied on the ground information. And then the, the other big part of what we do is our grants, funding innovative ideas surrounding sustainable ag. Um, and we do think that um, we're a different kind of grant program. I'm really um, proud to say that we've been doing this work for um, over 30 years. We've been decentralized, science-based, very much grassroots and practical problem solving and inclusive. Um, this isn't, um, it's not new to our work, any aspect there. And uh, it is a competitive grant making program. So lots of folks will put in applications and then a group of your peers will decide which ones to suggest for funding. And you've probably seen a diagram that looks something like this before if you care about sustainable ag, the sort of three-legged stool uh, or triple bottom line. Successful SARE grantees are looking at projects that engage with probably more than one of those legs, but definitely at least one of them, whether it's um, agriculture that's ecologically sound, economically viable, socially responsible. You can see that the SARE mission is the sweet spot right in the middle. Um, in your proposal, you're going to want to uh, make sure to address how you are um, focusing on sustainable ag practices and principles, not just agriculture overall. You'll probably hear me say that more than once. Um, and just in general, 
our grants um, explore problems identified by farmers and ranchers. That's a little different for the youth educator grants, but we definitely encourage you to partner directly with farmers and ranchers if that makes sense for your project. Here's a, a big picture list of some of the topics um, that are in our portfolio, types of topics that grantees have tackled over the years. So let's zoom in a little bit on the Youth Educator Grant in particular. Um, I've got some nitty gritty details here for you. And just to note that these slides are all available uh, for download from our website. I actually made it a few edits, so I'm going to get Marie the newest version <laughs> and we'll get those up on the website for you to download directly. So don't feel like you have to scribble every single thing down. Um, big picture, just to say again, these grants help youth educators encourage youth to try sustainable practices and explore sustainable ag as a viable career option. Um, and outreach to other educators is important because it helps these funds ripple out, not just for say you and your project that you're proposing at your school or organization or community garden or what have you, but help other educators feel equipped to teach about sustainable ag um, in their own setting. Um, so this could be through, you know, sharing the lesson plans that you develop and utilize in your community, for instance. Um, speaking of examples, let me give you an example of a really rock star youth ed project. The, um, this was a 2022 project, um, the Agriculinary Internship, um, and the goal was to implement a farm to school action plan um, to increase students' understanding of organic farming practices and introduce them to career options and provide teachers with professional development workshops. I mean, it was a heavy hitting project. Um, and uh, they, uh, the school is in the, um, in Ferguson, Missouri, in the heart of, uh, urban area, right? And they have a, a 14 acre organic farm right in the city limits. And so they developed this internship program for high schoolers. They had visits from, with those high schoolers and the, the nonprofit staff to elementary schools to talk about what's fresh, meaning what's in season. And they had taste tests and it was just a really neat project. But they also had some of those ripples. They published an internship project guide. So if um, others are thinking about hosting high school interns, paid interns on their farm, how do you go about crafting that? Um, and they used some of their um, success with their SARE project to actually secure other grant funds and forge new working collaborations. Um, and for as beautiful as that project was, every other youth educator project looks a little different. So I'm going to show you in a little bit how to find out what's been funded recently so you can see a, a broader list of examples um, in urban and rural spaces, large and small farms, lots of different types of agriculture. All right, so there we go. All right, some of the grant basics. We've already talked about a few of these. Grants are up to $6,000. We encourage applicants to collaborate, whether it's a school system collaborating with farmers, whether it's a nonprofit collaborating with schools, whether it's a university working with uh, the local FFA program. Collaboration can be as diverse as all of you. Um, but we don't want you to feel like you have to go it alone. Um, each year we get about 60 or so applications and we fund about 15 projects. So it's a pretty decent success rate. Um, and my pitch to people is always, you know, filling out a SARE grant application, even if you're not funded, one, you're going to get feedback from your reviewers, um, and two, you're going to have put pen to paper and really sketched out the project that you have in mind. So even if you don't get the funding, you're going to have a really good sense of what it is you're actually trying to do, how much money you really need, who's going to help, what your timeline is, etc. So I think it's worth your time to fill this out. Um, the deadline is Thursday, November 7. Of this year 2024 at 4 p.m central um oh and one note i didn't put on there these grants do not require matching funds um and oh the other thing i would add is that if you've never applied for a grant before this is a really good one to start with um it's pretty approachable um and i think you'll see that as we go through the what's actually in the the list of questions you have to answer um who can apply we think of a youth educator as someone who's working at or with uh, 4-H, FFA, junior manners, extension, maybe a school system, public or private, maybe nonprofits, maybe homeschool groups, could be the farms and ranches themselves, and beyond. 
Um, so if you're wondering, do I count as a youth educator? You probably do. Um, but by all means, uh, shoot me an email or text or call and we can chat it through if you want to be sure before you put together an application. And then I want to take a little more time to talk about the outreach piece of this. Um, the outreach to other educators is critical because this is federal funding. So what you learn and develop during your grant project is not proprietary, meaning it's going to be open source. And so what we ask you to do in your application, in your proposal, is to share how you want to share. <laughs> you tell us what that looks like for you. Maybe it's hosting a webinar or workshop, in person or otherwise. Maybe it's posting a series of lesson plans for other teachers and educators to use. Perhaps a series of short videos showing how you did a project in your education space. Uh, an article or a presentation at a conference. There's really no limit to what that outreach could look like. It's just a question of what works for you and your skills and, and how you enjoy um, sharing with other educators. Um, now, you might be starting to think like, OK, how could I spend this money? Um, so we've listed out a few of the things you can spend SARE funds on. Educator time, farmer time, supplies, travel. Um, there are also some things you cannot spend SARE grant funds on, permanent structures branded attire, purchasing land, insurance, licenses, warranties. I've got the et cetera there because um, there's a pretty long list. Couldn't all fit on a slide for the can and can't. Um, but before I overwhelm you with that, let me just give you an example. Um, so, you know, these grants can't be used for day-to-day -day farming expenses, for instance, um, but they could be used if the farming expense is directly related to the project, right? That sort of supplies category. So for example, let's say we've got a community garden that wants to apply to do some youth programming um, that's innovative in their space and they're going to share out their um, their two-day farm camp agenda and lesson plans and they need to buy some seed. Well then the question is, is the seed for that two-day camp that's happening, you know, twice a month every month or is the seed for other initiatives within the community garden? If it's seeds for the youth focus project and they're going to plant or tend or harvest or somehow use the seed as part of their education event, great. Include it in your SARE fund um, and your budget and your proposal. If it's just seed for the community garden overall, um, then you can't. So hopefully that's useful. Feel free to ask all the questions um, about how, how things fall into which category. And then a couple more things here about sort of the decision making. So we, I'm really proud of the fact that we have a peer review panel process. So we have a group of educators who um, assess and, and score and debate about which projects to fund. Um, and the same is true for our other grant programs. If it's a grant for farmers, we have farmers and ranchers reviewing it, for instance. Um, in our call for proposals, uh, it's kind of a meaty document that you can download from the SARE website. I'll show you how. Um, we have the full scoring criteria that our reviewers use. And so my pro tip here is try scoring your own application um, or ask maybe someone else to uh, who can be objective um, and improve it based on that assessment. Um, I think that's a really uh, useful tip for any grant you're writing. And then the review committee of your peers, they're going to put together a slate of proposals. They're going to give that to our administrative council, which is sort of like our nonprofit board if we were a nonprofit. Um, and those folks make the final decisions about which proposals are funded. Speaking of, let's think about the timeline here. So grants are due November 7. You would find out by mid-February if you received a grant or not. Um, and then you would have the first 75% of the funds available um, in mid-April to mid-May, depends how quickly you fill out all your paperwork. <laughs> and then um, you would have 75% of those funds to, to get going. Um, so in plenty of time for uh, late spring and summer activities, for instance. Um, these projects can last up to 23 months. They don't have to. Lots of people write one-year youth educator projects, um, and that's totally fine. Um, but sometimes they go over, and that's okay too. Um... So let's say you had a one-year project. Um, after one year, if the whole project was done, you'd spend all the money, you'd fill out a progress report and a final report, and you'd get your final 25%, all in one fell swoop. But if you have a two-year project, or maybe you have a few delays, 
you're going to give us a progress report about a year in, just so we know like, hey, things are going okay, or maybe you have questions. And then after the project is totally complete, you do a final report. And that report is available online, it's public, it's another way that people can learn from your project through the SARE database. All right. Um, and just to reiterate, you know, you can plan your grant activities with that cash flow in mind. Um, we want to make sure folks understand when the money's coming. And a note, if, you know, we do have some farmers and ranchers apply as youth educators, because some of them are youth educators. Um, and I just want to note that if this is going directly to your farm or ranch business, this income is taxable income. And so I'd encourage you to talk to your tax professional about how this is going to affect your tax reality. Um, it's a little more straightforward if it's going to a school system or nonprofit. Um, I mentioned reporting. So just to say that we have a, a basic digital report that you'll fill out and uh, we don't want it to be scary, right? It's just meant to ask questions like, how many students did you engage? What did they learn? Did you reach your objectives? If so, how? If not, how? Um, how did you share with other educators, etc.? cetera? Um, so that reporting process is relatively painless. Okay, our last big section uh, before we get to some Q&A is how do you go about writing this proposal? And what, is, what does it even ask for? So I think of it in four basic parts. I'm gonna put them on the screen here. And we're gonna walk through all of these. Um, and there's a very detailed step-by-step -step, um, plan for you. Uh, the URL's there on the screen. But I'll propose um, that you think of it this way. So step one, decide if your idea is a good fit for a SARE grant. A couple of great tools to have in your toolbox for doing this um, is to download the call for proposals. So on the northcentral.sare.org website that you see there, if you click on the Youth Educator Grant, you're going to get through to this page. And it's got these lovely buttons in the bottom right-hand corner. You can also use the QR code there. Um, and um, you're going to download the call. It's going to look a little something like this. Um, and read through it. It's nice bedtime reading. Uh, it's going to tell you some of the things you're already hearing today, but it's got even more detail than we can talk through. Um, that might give you a good sense of if your project is a good fit or not. Another good option, back on that Youth Educator page on our website, there's a list of last year's funded projects. That that really helps me when I'm trying to see, like, oh, is my idea a good fit for, for this funder? Am I thinking on the right sort of scale of project? Am I going to do enough? Am I thinking of trying to cram too many things into this $6,000 budget? Um, because remember, our reviewers are your peers, and so they don't want to see you trying to shoot for the moon um, with only $6,000. They want a realistic project that you're going to be able to complete. Um, and then the other uh, way to look for uh, other recently funded projects is through the SARE projects website. So this is a different website. It's projects.sare.org. Um, and you're going to be able to look at uh, past projects. And I think this is really important as you think about your proposal to see, well, has SARE already funded something similar? If so, can you build on that good work? Um, are you the first trying to uh, trying out an approach or a curriculum or an idea in your setting? Um, that's part of how you position your project as being innovative. So um, you can press that search projects button on the website and you're going to get a page that looks kind of like a, a Google search, right? And you can type in search terms. You know, maybe you type in internship or cover crops or um, farm visits, etc. And you can start to see what else is happening. Okay, that's step one. Figure out if your project's a good fit. Step two ask for help. Um, I've heard my boss say that we're a really hands-on grant program, and, and what she means by that is that we are here, and uh, it's our job to help you. So we want to be um, at your service if we can be. Um, that's my cell. You can text or call. I've got my email. Um, there are some other people who can help also. So every state has a coordinator for SARE who's paid, um, you know, a portion of their job is to help with SARE programs. And if you reach out to them, they may even be able to review a draft of a grant or just talk with you about your idea to help you hone it a little bit before you get too far into your writing. Um, same goes for the Michael Fields Institute. You see their website there. 
Um, there's a person named Ren Alamitra on the other end of that email address, and she can help you with um, grant applications as well. That's all free and one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then I think also think of other allies who are maybe in your community. It might be extension educators, staff at soil and water conservation districts, um, others who maybe from your neck of the woods who have had SARE grants. Um, don't um, don't just wonder about a question. There are loads of people you could ask, and um, no question is too small. Okay, step three of four, develop your actual proposal. So the proposal really has three parts. The narrative section, the who, what, when, where, how, why, etc. Um, the budget, and a couple of attachments. So we're going to walk through all three of these. Um, oh, and here's another pro tip. Um, when you're drafting this narrative part, what I would suggest is to draft it in either Word or Google or whatever word processor you use to make it easy to edit and to um, have others review it if that's what you want or collaboration. But then you're going to copy and paste your, your final answers and text into projects.sare.org. Okay, so what are the questions? I'm going to shut up for a minute and just let you look at these. These are the first five of nine that you'll answer. Okay, I'm very embarrassed that there's a typo on this uh, slideshow for educators. I'm sure you all noticed it. Bear with me. Um, some more basic questions that you'll have to answer. And I want to point out a couple notes on these. So on number six on evaluation, I think some folks have felt like they had to um, do a huge amount of evaluation. We've got some examples in the call for proposal. Um, we're not asking for um, endless amounts of work. And in fact, your evaluation in the scoring criteria doesn't count for as much as, say, your, your timeline and activities. But we do want you to do something to figure out if your efforts were successful. It could be a before and after, uh, you know, knowledge test with uh, older kids. Maybe with younger kids, it comes more in the form of a game, right? There's it, Maybe it's a parent survey. There's really no wrong answer there. Um, sustainable ag practices, we need you to say more than just, we'll talk about sustainable agriculture. We really want you to say like, oh, we're going to focus all our energy on pollinators, or we're thinking a lot about soil health and in particular, you know, microbial life or cover crops, or, you know, there's not a wrong answer again, but we do need you to get detailed there. Um, activities and timeline, relatively straightforward. And then sharing with other educators, like we talked about, just laying out how you're gonna share specifically with other educators. Okay, the budget. So a couple of um, pointers here. You're really just answering, well, what items do you need to carry out the project? So in this example, this is somebody's budget line item. Um, they wanna buy some wine cap mushroom spawn, right? That's what you use to grow mushrooms. So the categories, materials and supplies, there'll be a drop down list for you to choose from. The description is simply, wine cap mushrooms. The amount is $60, and then uh, that's just your total. And then for justification, you do have to, I think of it as showing your math, like you have to show how you got to that amount. So if those packages cost $30 each and you need two packages, that's 60 bucks. We have some more examples in the call for proposal. Um, and um, to that end, here are a few more examples right here. Um, it's meant to be relatively straightforward, but we have to have this level of detail for the USDA when we put this paperwork through to them. So we need to know number of hours, an hourly rate, we need to know number of miles, and the reimbursement rate per mile, etc. All right, last but not least, attachments. So you're going to have two supporting documents. One is your letter of support, which is simply a one-page letter from someone else saying why your project is going to be great. Um, you might include, um, they might speak to your experience and ability to carry out the project or why the project's needed and how it's going to benefit other um, ag educators or meet a need that ag educators face. Um, or perhaps the person's going to say, you know, how they're going to support your project. Um, the you, That's all I'll say on that, I suppose. Um, but do ask these folks early. Don't ask them 
on November 5th, right, when the grant is due on the 7th. Um, and then everybody's going to fill out the first question on a livestock care plan. If your project does not involve any vertebrate livestock, you just say no to the first question and you're done. But if you have any um, vertebrate livestock in your project, we just need to have you fill that out so that we're following our university's rules at the University of Minnesota, where we're based. Um, and I did have a grantee recently tell me that the livestock care plan was really intimidating. So if you feel that way, reach out and we can just walk through those questions one by one and, and um, help you know what to put there because we don't want it to stop you from doing any um, work with youth and livestock if that's a key part of your project. Um, in the second half hour, we are going to walk through some step-by-step -step, uh, details of how to use the online system to apply, but I'll just point out, we do have a whole series of how-to videos, um, and those are on the NCR SARE YouTube channel. Um, so if you say, like, right now, I gotta go, um, that's okay. When you have a question about how to do a budget, there's a video for that. When you have a question about outreach, there's a video for that. And some of them have um, past grantees sharing about their projects and, and how they approach things. So hopefully those are going to be a useful tool for you. Um, but right now, I think we should pause for questions. Um, Marie, I can't see the chat. Oh, now I can. Would you, uh, let's see, would you tell me if we have anything that we ought to cover? There's nothing in the chat, but there are two great questions in the Q&A. Oh, and great. I can read them to you if you'd like. Per please, that'd be perfect. Okay, first question is, can we pay for a videographer that will put together a video we can share? Yes, absolutely. Um, you would just need to get some sort of a quote from that person with a, a you know, uh, hourly rate that you can put into your budget. If you just say, videographer, $500, uh, Gene, our contracts person, will say, I need more details. <laughs> but in terms of just overall, yes or no, absolutely. The other question is regarding um, proposal question number five. Hmm. Back in your slides. Okay, question I'm going to go is, back so we can all see it together. In a, it's on innovation. Yes. An innovative mean innovative for our area. Yes. Okay. Um, that's a good point. I do not have that slide in this presentation, and I should add it because I think of innovative as one of two things. Either no one's ever thought of it ever before and it's brand spanking new, <laughs> or perhaps more likely um, you've seen something like this in other communities or settings or geographies, um, but never in your space. So um, I think that there are many, many things that are innovative for our school systems and our uh, in our communities related to sustainable ag. And we just need to, you to articulate how and why it is in your space. The next question is, can we pay for structure repairs? For example, purchase plastic replacements for our soup, for our hoop house. Hmm. Okay. I'm going to tell you what I think, but I'm going to write it down to, to double check. So, if it is permanent infrastructure, SARE funds cannot be used. But our definition of permanent uh, relates to uh, if it is something with concrete um, foundations, with electricity wired in, et cetera. Um, so a hoop house is actually a really great example because although most people don't move hoop houses, you certainly can. They are rebar in the ground. You could just pick them up and move them. Uh, if you want to put that time and energy in. So in that particular case, I think the, the the new layer of plastic for your hoop house would actually work. If you had a greenhouse that was a permanent structure with, you know, a stone walkway down the middle and water and power and foundation, a concrete foundation, and you wanted new glass panels for the side of it, we could not do that because that's permanent infrastructure. The next question is, um, it goes back to the list of sustainable practices you had included. Mm -hmm. And it says, it asks if you can expand on how we select what sustainable practices our project focuses on. Yes. I don't necessarily understand how organic agriculture doesn't include some of the others. Also, 
one of the practices is managed grazing and I don't see where it says what that is including. Mm, yes. Okay. So I have a two-part answer. <laughs> Part number one is when you're filling out your proposal, we ask you to pick the one that fits best, knowing that the whole point of sustainable agriculture is that these things are interlocking and interwoven. Um, we ask you that mostly so that when reviewers are reviewing, we can lump proposals together and, and sort our teams based on their expertise. Um, if you're funded and you're going to, um, and you, you're carrying out your project, then you go to fill out your report, um, your progress report and your final report, you'll be able to click off multiple. Um, so that first one isn't actually public. It's really just for our sorting um, and review process. And you'll have all the flexibility later. Um, the In terms of the management, managed grazing, in my mind, that includes um, anything that's not just continuous grazing. So that could be rotational grazing, management intensive grazing, mob grazing, um, multi-species grazing, um, anything that's focused on um, maybe a more management intensive model. Is that helpful? We're going to assume The next question that's... is, yeah, I think so. They can always let us know. Exactly. They need more follow-up. Um, the next question is, can we pay for travel cost of the partners that are participating in this grant? Yes, absolutely. You can include that as a line item in your budget. Um, and I'm just going to flip to a couple slides there. So the very bottom line um, is travel to present at an education conference, but it could also be travel to get farmers to your education space um, so that they can present to your kids. Um, it could be school bus travel to get the kids to the farm um, or commercial kitchen or what have you. Next question is how much of aquaculture supplies can be incorporated into grant, into grant supplies to create a demonstration site for youth curriculum build? Oof, that's a good one. Um, aquaculture uh, has been a little um, tricky, I think, for us because um, depending on how you build it, it, it could be permanent or not. Um, and also because there are now a lot of kits out there. And I know that in the last year or two, we've had a number of teachers um, apply to get an in-classroom kit. Um, and there were actually multiple applications from teachers asking for the exact same thing. They all wanted a kit for their classroom because it's a really neat tool. Um, but I think none of them made the case for how they were going to share out with other educators and equip them to utilize this tool in their own spaces. Um, so... I think most things can be included in a SARE funded budget, but I would love for you to email me maybe a draft of that budget and I could review it with our contracts person just to be sure. The other thing I'll say about the budget is that um, if you, you know, say like, oh, I'm not going to run it by Liz, I'm not going to bounce it off my state coordinator. I think I'm good. If you have an error in there, um, our contracts person, Gene, is great about working with people to say like, okay, actually, that $300 line item is not allowed, um, but the you were funded based on your objectives. We need another $300 line item, something else that can fit in there that's still going to push you towards your objectives, and you're just going to have to find a different uh, way to pay for that exact item that is not fundable with our, with our pot of money. Um, I think that's a strength. You may disagree, but I think it is. Um, next question is, can you pay for a charter bus to get to a field trip? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't see any other questions coming through. A couple follow-ups to say yes, that you answered the question Great. that was asked. Super. Well, let's do this. I'm going to walk you through some of the, how the online system works and we'll pause for questions again at the end and I'll have my contact info as well. Um, so that if you think of others, you can ask, Oh, I'll also highlight right now in case anybody does have to step away. We're going to try something this year. We're going to do office hours. So I'm going to be here on zoom, but we won't be recording it or anything. It'll just be a, a meeting where anybody can pop in and ask a question. Um, and so those times are listed there. 
um, we'll send those in a follow-up email to everybody who is on the webinar. Um, if you want to pop into one of those and ask a question, if that's easier than email or text, then super. And we can all learn from each other's questions. Okay, so how about some details about using our online system? It's a relatively friendly system, um, but if it's your first time applying for a grant uh, or your first time using our system, it could be new to you. So let's just walk through. Um, you're going to go to projects.sare.org. You're going to see this screen and you're going to either log in or create an account. If you're brand new, you're going to click create an account and um, it's pretty typical. You're going to have to like register and then verify your, uh, your email address and have a password and log in, that sort of thing. Um, the first thing you're going to be asked to do if you're new is to fill out uh, demographic data. And I just want to really highlight that this is not tied to your application in any way. Um, we can't see it. Um, we only get the amassed details at the end um, so that we can get a sense of, are we doing a good enough job um, reaching underserved communities, serving the geographic diversity of our 12 states, etc. cetera. Um, so this is for our improvement. Once you're in the system, um, this is the page you're going to see. And so to get started, you're probably going to just press start a new grant proposal. And then you have to choose the North Central region. That's us. And you're going to see there are four grant applications open right now. You have to pick the Youth Educator Grant and begin a new proposal. Um, and then it's going to start walking you through some things you need. Um, for each item that's in red there, uh, that says like missing title or missing description, you click on the edit button and type in your answer and you press save for each and every one. Um, and if you don't know the answer for that particular one, you can put in gobbledygook for now and go back and, and fix it. Um, let's see. It'll give you a chance to add any co-coordinators if you have some, say a, a co-educator or another organization is um, full partners on this and you want them to be a full part of the application process, you're allowed to do that here. Um, you can also have folks who are collaborators, but they don't have to have that level of um, co-writing the application and the paperwork and such. That's up to you. And then you're just going to start going through some of these general information questions for each one after you've filled in your answer. You know, you've pressed edit, you've put in your answer, you've pressed save. Now you get a green, happy green check. Um, and that's how you know that your question is done and you can move on. You can return to the main page with that proposal overview button um, or just keep cranking with the next button and go on to the next section. If you do go back to the main page, you're going to see this general um, overview of what are the main sections. And you can just pick which one you want to work on on that given day. And for that, sort of like the making the red X go away, in this case, once the once you've finished a section, when you're back on that main page, the red asterisk will have gone away. So you can see your progress that way. Um, jumping to the budget, I'll say that we have a lot of instructions for the budget um, in the call for proposal, just to really walk you through it, trying to make this as approachable and accessible as we can. Um, and, um, and you can also just get in there and press add a budget item and start um, messing around with it and see see what you can see. So when you press add a budget item, it's basically a line item in your budget that you're going to add um, one by one. Each item gets its own line. And you're going to get a box that looks like this um, for each and every one. So you're going to pick category. This is a drop down list. These are your options. Is it equipment? Is it materials and supplies? Is it other direct costs? Is it personnel? Is it travel? Right, so that charter bus would be in the travel camp. Um, a person's travel to get to a, a conference would be in that camp. But if you need um, aquaculture, that would probably be in the materials and supplies category. So you're going to choose your category. You're going to type in a simple description. What is it that you want to buy? Um, and then in the details or justification, remember that justification word is sort of a misnomer. It's really not you saying why you need it. It's just saying how you got the total uh, amount. So always include the cost per item, how many you need, and the total cost there. And then last but not least, you fill in the total amount. 
So we've got an example on this. Uh, they're going to buy 27 potted marshmallow plants for a trial. Um, the 27 plants, they cost $15.99 each. So now we get a total. Um, and this, this justification is just like spot on. They've got every little detail. Um, noting, for instance, in this case, perennial plants, you can only include 50% of the cost. So now they've got their 50% cost and they've rounded up in this case. You've got to, we can only take whole dollars. So that was a lot of details. Um, the key ones there are include your math of the cost per item um, and how many you need round up or down if you need to. And if you have a question about a, a perennial something or uh, more permanent equipment, does it count as infrastructure, does it not? By all means, be in touch. Okay, and then after you've done that one single line item, you're pressing save, and you can see there what a save budget item looks like. And here on the next screen is a, a whole series. So somebody's made a lot of headway with their budget. It's maybe even done. Um, and we have a sample budget in the call for proposals also. Okay, and then um, one more key thing is this livestock care plan. If your project does not include livestock, when you go to that, the first question, you'd just say no save and it won't make you fill out any more of the questions if the answer is yes it's going to ask you things like do you have a vet that you can call if there's a problem um tell us about your shelter how are you gonna uh what are you gonna feed these animals etc just to make sure that the animals will be treated humanely um in the project okay so let's say you you filled out all the sections um i definitely recommend here's my last pro tip i think uh Click on this view a draft at any time. Um, and the the beauty there is that you can share that out with someone else to read. You can just like let it rest for a day and then look at it all printed out as opposed to on the screen. You'll probably catch some errors that way. And then when everything is done and beautiful and you're ready um, and you've got all sections filled out, this submit proposal button will appear. You won't be able to find it until everything, every box uh, has an answer in it. And when you're ready, you can press submit. I will point out, you gotta submit twice, you gotta press submit twice. So then you're gonna get this pop-up uh, box. And so you'll press submit proposal again, and then you're official. Um, and you'll get an email from our system saying, um, you know, congrats and thank you. There's a little optional follow-up survey, but your work is done. Now, if it's before the deadline and you realize like, oh, darn it, I made an error. I wanna go back and fix it. You can log back into the system and um, make corrections. Just make sure you press submit twice again so that it's officially submitted again. Um, let's see. I think that's all of the details about navigating that online system. And I'm really just going to leave you with some key next steps before we do some more Q&A. Okay, so do we have anything else in the, the Q&A or the chat, Marie? Yes, we do. Nice. Um, one question about um, what is allowed in terms mm -hmm. of paying. Can you pay for an educational class to bring yourself up to speed on what you are presenting for the class? That's a great question. We recently had another grant that did that very thing. Um, I think it's unusual. So if you're going to include it, I would say explain why um, and explain how that's going to bring you up to speed so that you really are ready to teach about it. I think as educators, we all know you just got to be a chapter or a day ahead. Right. But, um, you know, maybe it's a, a unique topic, something you can't just learn about in other ways. Um, so I'd say explain it. Um, and especially if it's a major expense. And the next question I can answer, actually. <laughs> Great. Please. Um, is this session recorded and will we have access to it? The answer is yes. The session is being recorded. Um, it's going to be mailed out to everyone who registered. So that includes you. 
It will also be posted online on our website and I'll put that link in the chat. Um, it can take, it probably won't go up until tomorrow because it takes a while to process um, in the background before I can upload it. So maybe check tomorrow. Um, and then we have a um, question in the, the chat. What about renewals of license, for example, Master Gardener certification? I am guessing not. I know that um, we our funds can't be used for warranties, insurance, or licenses. Now, I think those are more typically for like a food processing space or something like that, but I think it extends to people as well. Um, if that is uh jessica if that's something you want me to email you about just um put your um maybe shoot me an email how about that that's probably the smartest way to do that and um i will find out for triple sure you know <laughs> all right did we do it marie i don't see any other questions coming through okay um well, we um, we are really excited to see your ideas and your proposals. Um, we're here to help. We've got um, a full month before these are due. Um, so by all means, be in touch. Let us know how we can help. Um, and, um, and yeah, keep up the good work that you're doing already.